Welcome to Second Baptist Church. Welcome to Second Baptist Church. We're going to have a great time today, and we're going to share some. Paul Street's coming up for the youth in about three, two weeks. Is that right? Yeah, two. Yeah, two weeks. Um, still need some scholarship help, some food help. What do we need? Have we covered? Very good. Very, very good. So um, we're going to take a group of youngins to Youth Falls Creek, and they'll share with us about their experiences, just like our children will hear in just a moment. And that's coming up. And then we've got a mission trip to Omaha. If you have not told me this morning, I need to hear from you if you want to go, because I'm going to be gone and won't be able to take care of that business. If you're interested in the Omaha mission trip, you need to tell me so I can fix you up so that you're ready to go to, I believe I'm saying it incorrectly, it's supposed to be Omaha. There we go. Got to get it correct. And so if you're interested in that, got a lot of ministry opportunities coming up with our, our Bible day. We're going to study Jonah. Looks good. And in everything that happens, I mean, I mean everything that happens here inside the church house or out in the street or in your workplace or in your home or when the teenagers go to Falls Creek or when we have our Bible Adventure Day with Jonah or wherever it might be, here's my hope, my prayer for you. Please, 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 don't miss Jesus. Let's sing today. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, brethren. We have met to worship. Um, we're here to love God with our whole our whole self. 
and, uh, and that's what he wants from each and every one of us. The last verse says, let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Here we go. Sing it, church.
And so we were there. Um, and we got seven I ams. We got, we got, let me see here. What was, oh yeah, there we go. What was the first thing that we did together as a big group each morning in Tabernacle? Tabernacle. In Tabernacle. Big group. The first thing when he called us to our attention, what did he do with this first thing? Look behind you, girls. Saluted the flag. There you go. Okay. So, all right. So, so we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag. Then. Christian flag. Then. The Bible. Then the Bible. Now, did you memorize the Pledge of the Bible? Probably not. I didn't tell you to. so sharp and sometimes when when the kids all got the answers right we just you know, we just took care of things yeah that was 80 kids uh one night i threw guitar picks out all these kids wanted a guitar pick so uh we did things i threw frisbees out our, our guy threw a, a boomerang around the thing and had fun what was your favorite thing at camp Responded to the gospel. Swimming, eating, I like her. Walking, parking. Walking, okay. What was your favorite thing at camp? My favorite thing at camp was watching the kids grow throughout the week as they experienced God. Awesome. Same thing watch, watching these kids really grow and really come forward with a better knowledge than what we got there. Awesome, awesome, awesome. What happened on the way home? We ate Taco Bell. We ate Taco Bell, okay. <laughs> but, but, but remember when I stopped on the side of the highway? What happened? The bus broke down. That bus broke down. Bus broke down. Peyton, the bus broke down. And they called and asked us for help. So we turned around and went to go try to help. So we learned a little bit of what you can do about Peyton. Um, uh, so we, by the way, don't leave candy wrappers all over my auditorium. <laughs> Put it away and eat it later. Um, um, and uh, so we got to learn a little bit about being a good Samaritan. We were a little late getting home because we were almost at the top of the turnpike at Rock. Turned around, went all the way back. By the time we got there, two other churches had stopped and they got some help and got to go. But we got to uh, learn a little bit about being a good Samaritan. Then we ate at Taco Bell. And then we got home, cleaned up the bus. Here they are. Great group of kids. I'm glad you guys went. You guys went? Yes. Amen. Get off my stage. <laughs> just, uh, just so some of you will know, and so that you'll recognize and things like that. Each of the kids got a bag, each of them got a t-shirt. Our theme was I Am. We heard lessons about the seven I Am statements from the Bible uh, in the book of John, and, and we learned a whole bunch about that. There were... Uh, in the week we were there, the, the part of the week we were there, 2,513 campers at Falls Creek. In the first part of the week, 2,569, 5,082 total attendance at Children's Camp. Total decisions at Children's Camp were 612. 418 of those decided that they wanted to follow Jesus Christ and pray to receive Christ as their Savior, responding to the gospel. Now, um, and, and we're going to visit with them, and we're going to talk with them, and we're going to share with them in their churches and stuff. In our cabin, we had five churches. We had 88 campers in our cabin. Ten of the students in our cabin responded to the call um, at, at the invitation time. Two of them from our church specifically responded, and we're going to visit, and we're going to share with them about their relationship with Christ. Because sometimes when you go to camp, you can be in the moment, and, and you can just, oh, it's, you know, and everybody's moving and all that kind of thing. And so we're going to talk and we're going to visit and we're going to help solidify 
what's going on. But if you're going to pray for these young men and women, that they will live out those I am things that they've learned about that, that tell us who Jesus is. Uh, would you just clap for them and say, hey, kids, we're praying for you. That's what you got. Okay? You got your love, and we're glad that we got to take you to Falls Creek. Falls Creek is an awesome, awesome, awesome place. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow begins week number one of youth camp. There are eight weeks, Noah, eight. There's eight youth weeks, one children's week, and then Indian week, right? And then college, okay, college. So uh, the, the next nine weeks now, right? The next nine weeks, there are going to be lots, thousands of people at Falls Creek. You'd be praying for Falls Creek. What's going on there? The preachers that are there, the worship leaders that are there, the, the cooks that are there. We've got awesome cooks, the ladies who paid the cook in our cabin. Um, the, the, the people who are just there to walk around with the kids and help them. The staff that's there. Two people from our church, our staff members there. Noah will be leaving Friday to head up there. And Rachel is already there. You saw her beautiful smiley face up on the, on the thing. And uh, you pray for them because the whole idea, the whole idea of camp is this. That no matter what happens inside the cabin or in the tabernacle or at the icy stand or uh, around the campus or when we leave the campus and we come home, whatever happens to our buses, whatever restaurant we go to eat in, whatever kind of homes we come back to, the most important thing, the thing that I desire most for the kids and that I'm praying for for every student bus Fall Street this year is this, that when they're wherever they are doing whatever they're doing, that they don't miss Jesus. And I hope you don't even. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Father, so much for Jesus. And for the fact that we don't need to miss Jesus. The fact that Jesus came to show us how we can live by showing us who he is. And I thank you, Father, that because of who Jesus is, we can know eternal life. Because he is the way to that eternal life. And then we have life for our path to show us where to go and how to be there. And we have sustenance because he's the bread of life. And all of the other things that we studied. And Father, I pray that you be real to these kids. And Father, I pray that as our youth go to camp, they study under the theme of glory. I pray God that they'll see your glory. That they'll see your greatness. And as they hear the good news of the gospel, that those who need to respond would do so. Come to know Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sharing Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. I pray in his name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
out of breath just listening to him sing. I mean, I tell you, I'll say it again. I hope it's not so redundant that it doesn't uh, seem genuine, but we have the best musicians and everything, everybody else all over this town. It's God has been so good to us to bless us with some great music, some awesome musicians and some people whose passion is to be a part of that. Thank you to all of those of you who have and do participate in our music this this week at, at camp and, and i'm breaking from genesis guys sorry uh you get a month's break from genesis till i get back from africa okay um 
but we, we talked about these seven I am statements. And my sermon notes are on y'all's shirts, so y'all got to sit up and listen so I can read my sermon. Okay, there you go. Um, we, we talked about these, and, and, and I'm going, you know, we go back to Exodus and, and Moses and, and the, the burning bush there in the beginning parts of the book of Exodus. And God got Moses' attention and said, I've got a job for you to do. You're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to say, let my people go. And who should I tell these people sent me? And God said, I am has sent you. You tell them that I am. Not I was. Not I'm fixing to be. Not I'm going to be. Not I might be later. Not I used to was. But I am sent you. And that's where this thing begins. And way back in Exodus. Way back at the beginning of Scripture. And then we read and we, and we follow on. And we get to the book of John. And John keys into this seven ways to tell us who this Messiah is. And relating to to us the reality that this Messiah is no less than God in the flesh. That He is God who has put on flesh and has come to us. And He tells us with these seven I am's. And the people who would be reading this and hearing John preach this and share this kind of thing and hearing Jesus say these words out of His own mouth would, would be people, many of whom would respond back to these writings about Moses on the backside of the desert seeing this strange thing. Here's a bush, and it's a fire. And, oh, I better go see this thing. And he walked over and saw that the bush was not being consumed by the fire and heard the voice of God there. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. I have a job for you. Go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let my people go. I am who's sending you. And by the way, at the end of that story, toward the end of it, Moses said, okay, that's who you are, but who am I? And he says, I have sent you. You are the one I have sent. And, and that fits to you and I as well, when we consider who the person of Jesus is. He said, I am the door or the gate. The shepherd comes through that door, that gate, and if you come in any other way, you're a thief, you're a robber, you're a liar. He said, I'm the good shepherd and my sheep hear my voice. And see, can you see how that would remind them back then? Can you see how when the, the, the flame of fire in Exodus would call them there and John would write, he said, listen, I am the, the, the door, the gate. You've got to enter, enter by me. And, and God called his attention over. You've got to come over here. And this is holy ground. Take off your shoes, Moses, because it's a place where you're supposed to be and it's holy ground. And, 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 and so he said, and then I'm the shepherd. And they, would, they understood about shepherds too, didn't they? Because they knew about sheep and they knew about shepherds. Before you read that passage of Scripture, you need to know the people he's talking to knew about sheep and shepherds. I'm the light of the world. He said a city set on a hill cannot be hid. And people don't light a candle and then stick a bucket over the top of it. He said put it under a bushel, put it under a basket. But they put it on a lamp stand so everybody can see unless you're a kid at camp. And if you're a kid at camp, you hide it under your blanket so nobody can tell what you're doing, right? You know? In the old days, it was to read your comic book. Today, if we didn't keep them out of their hands, it would be to, you know, Snapchat or whatever they do on their cell phones. Yeah, it's all the same thing. But we don't hide the light. We open the light up. Do you see how they might think? When he said, I am, they would be thinking, hmm, Moses, I am the light of the world. Oh, yeah, burning bush got the attention of Moses and brought Moses over to him in the beginning of Exodus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. I am, have sent you, and nobody comes to the Father. Moses went to the Father. Do you see how these things might have reminded them of the Scripture that they knew so that as God was speaking to them, he would be speaking to them in things that they could understand and really know were the voice of God? I am the bread of life. Oh, they knew about bread. And they, could, and they would remember when Moses was leading the children out of the land of Egypt, out of their slavery. He would remind them not, not just of the bread that they would bake, but of the manna that God would provide. That, what does manna mean? Kids, what does manna mean? What does it mean? I know you wrote it in your notes. Don't tell them. Oh, no. Manna does not mean bread. 
what does mana bring mean? Hmm? No. However, it would remind them of that, and we would use some of that in other countries. You were listening to a missionary. Good job. Mana means audience. Help them out. What is it? Yeah! You remember now, don't you? It's easy to remember once somebody reminds you. That's cool. Um, and, and so it would remind them of the manna that God would feed them with when they were following Moses who followed the one who said, I am and sent you. Do you see how these things that Jesus would say would not just be words that a man would say, but would be words that would remind them of things that they ought to know because they had studied and because they had learned Scripture. I am the resurrection and I am the life. And, and as he talked about that, he's beginning to talk about what will happen as this Messiah comes that Moses talks about when he speaks in, in the Ten Commandments that you should have no other God before me. And then as he talks, and Jesus begins to change the channel into the reality of why he came, that no man uh, is going to be saved except through me. I'm the resurrection. Even if you're dead, yet shall you live, he said. And then I am the vine or the tree, and you are the branches. And you're going to go out and you're going to bear much fruit. And it would remind them of the fact that God provided for them the fruit they needed. And it would remind them of the covenant that we've been studying in Genesis from Abraham. How his seed would, would magnify into all of the earth and be like the sand of the sea and the, and the stars of the sky. And, and it's, it's just amazing how when, when Jesus said these kinds of words, like the ones we're going to look at specifically here in John 14, just because I picked it because it's my favorite one. Uh, how it would go back to the things that they already knew. And here's the part of the lesson to begin with here. It's this. When you feel like you're hearing something from God, when you feel like God's really speaking to you and telling you something, get into His Word and correlate that thing that you're hearing. Make sure it's not just something of your imagination. Oh, I know it's not my imagination because it feels so good. I don't care how it feels. I'm going to tell you this right now. There's a lot of stuff that God might just say to you that ain't going to feel good. Have you been there with me? He might say, go to this place and do this thing, and it ain't going to be a happy place or a happy thing, that, but, but you know you've got to do it. He might say to you, get humble and, and go and, and, and visit with this person and, and, and fix what was wrong. And, and you might need to humble you. That's never fun. Might not feel good. I'm not looking to feel good when God says all this. I'm looking to hear from God so that I don't miss Jesus. But if all I want to do is feel good, I'm going to miss Jesus. Because I guarantee you, when Jesus knelt down in the garden and began to pray, and the intensity of his prayer caused him to sweat as drops of blood, we can describe that physiologically now with the medical sciences. We know exactly what happened. He was so intense in his prayer that it burst the blood vessels around and near his sweat glands, and it mingled with the blood, and he sweat as drops of blood it, with the intensity of his prayer, saying, Lord, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. I guarantee you he wasn't feeling real good at that moment. When he went to the cross and they nailed his hands and feet to that cross and he hung there suffocating until he died of blood loss and suffocation. I guarantee you he wasn't feeling good. If, listen, if all you want to do is feel good the rest of your life, kids, and you think that feel good is how you hear from God, you're going to miss God. You're, you're, you're going to be someplace. You're going to miss Jesus. But if you will take God's word and put it with what you hear and see how it comes together and remember the things. Remember how our preacher told us that, that the, the lessons that Jesus taught were things that they were familiar with. They knew about bread. Y'all know about bread, don't you? If he had been over in Asia, he might have been in, in, in some countries in, in Southeast Asia, he might have used rice instead of bread because that was their food, right? That's what, in fact, in some places in Asia today, when they go and talk about the bread of life, they talk about the rice of life to make sure that people understand it. Oh, that's changing Scripture. No, that's telling Scripture the way Jesus would have. He said it to the people so that they would understand. And in John 14, he got so magnificently clear. He got so pointed that if they missed what he said here, they would miss all of eternity. 
they would miss the reality of what they had studied and what they had known as they studied through Genesis, just as we have been in recent months, and actually a couple of years, um, and, and studied through that and know the covenant that God made with Abraham about bringing a Messiah who would bring to them the reality of who God is in their life and allow them to be able to have their eternity in, in, in right order and in right place and have that taken care of. And he reminded them of that and he said that. And he got so pointed in John chapter 14. I'm just getting warmed up. I haven't even started yet. Just, John, see what Falls Creek will do to you folks? I'm telling you. Just wait till I get back from Africa. <laughs> Y'all better look out. All right. It's been more than two years since I've been to Africa. And, oh, by the way, y'all been praying that I'd be able to pass that, that COVID test that we've been, that I didn't pass <laughs> to go in February. At 7.00 something last night, I was handed a piece of paper that says PCR fluvid young medical word, medical word, medical word, negative. <laughs> had to have that 72 hours before I got on the airplane. God provided, God fixed that. So thank you guys for praying. Um, about that, and and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some great things. Glendon will be in this spot next Sunday morning, and I hope you're ready to uh, to hear from him. John chapter 14. I'm getting warmed up now. I'm ready to go. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture because it is clear. There can be no doubt. Some places you can look at and you can you can say, well, you can read it this way or you can read it that way. But John 14, you can't. John 14 is so pointedly clear when Jesus is speaking here that if you try to misinterpret this, you're going to miss the whole of the Bible. In fact, you're going to be someplace where you're going to miss Jesus. And I hope you don't miss Jesus. I really hope you don't miss Jesus. In John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking and he's talking about Peter's going to deny him and he's talking about all this kind of stuff. And then he says this, all of these things are going to happen. I love what our preacher said while we were at camp. Uh, he, he said, listen, in your life some bad things are going to happen. You're going to have a bad day once in a while. In fact, he said he used to do some premarital counseling. And he would say at the beginning of the premarital counseling, he said, at your wedding, something's going to go wrong. Can you, expect, can, can you remember that? At your wedding, did something go wrong? I have it on video. and My wife's telling me what's going on. Can I tell the story? Walking down the aisle. and yeah, my, he, She's walking down the aisle. And in her bouquet, there's supposed to be two flowers. And as she walks down this side of the aisle, her mom's sitting right there about where Teresa and Terry are. Teresa, you're not Teresa, you're Donna. Where Donna and Terry are. I got the right family group, okay? Um, and, and, and she's supposed to stop there at her mom, hand her mom a flower, give her a hug, in, in a symbol of saying, all right, I, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm not only a part of your family anymore. And she gets right about where Ralph is, and she looks square at me, I'm standing over here. Here comes my bride down the aisle. It's just so wonderful. And, it's so and there's a camera right here, right there, right across my head. And she mouths to me, I don't have them. We forgot to put the flowers in the bouquet for her to give to her mom. She's supposed to give one to my mom. You didn't know this. You're supposed to get one on the way out saying, okay, now I'm here. And it was just supposed to be a beautiful, I don't have, something went wrong. Okay. He said, something's going to go wrong. And when something goes wrong, just say, okay, that's what Steve said was going to go wrong. Now let's enjoy the rest of the day. In your life, something's going to go wrong. You're going to have that time when the bus breaks down coming down the hill from Falls Creek. That used to be a lot more common. I remember back in the 70s, all up and down I-35, buses scattered every week all up and down the place. Every, and, 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 and something's going to go wrong. And when that goes wrong... You remember that Jesus reminded us things were going to go wrong in John chapter 14, verse number 1, when he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I'm going, you know, and you know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. He should have been paying attention. <laughs> we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. So very pointed. First off, he tells us and he reminds us that there is a peace. When that bad thing happens, when that hard time comes, when that difficulty arrives, and when it comes and it faces us right now, just as they were about to face Jesus going on to the cross and Jesus then um, going into the grave. And, and even though he said he would rise in three days, there's that doubt because uh, we haven't seen this before. They didn't see rain before in the days of Noah either, but God said it would happen. And if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. That's just the way that it is. And, and, and God put on flesh and came down and with his very mouth he spoke these words let not your heart be troubled because you believe in God believe also in me have some peace and you can have peace I'm so I, I, I don't know what the word would be but it's so difficult for me to look at somebody whose whole desire in life just seems to be I want to be upset about something you know who I'm talking about? They're either going to be sad about it, they're going to be angry about it, they're going to be worried about it. Uh, you know, you, you know who I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not pointing at anybody. It's, it's, it's some of them other people in them other places, not here, right? I mean, everything that ha- I'm just got, we're driving along the road and it's got a sharp drop off over here. And sure enough, we're going to fall off of it, right? I'm so scared, I'm going to fall. just want to live in fear. Just want to be there. Whatever happens, you know, I'm, I'm going to go cut the grass now. Oh, I might cut it too short. I'm worried about that. You know, just silly things. Oh, I can't carry the trash out in the trash bag because the trash bag might break. Uh, little silly things. Great big things. I'm afraid to make a friend because sometimes you get hurt with friends. And I don't want to be hurt. I'm afraid to go take this test at school because I just might not do very good. I just want to be worried. Or the worst ones are the ones that I want to be angry. I want to be angry all the time. Some of us have issues with anger, don't we? I mean, we've got to be honest and say anger is easy. As a matter of fact, anger is real easy, at least for me. And, and we, we have a hard time there and have difficulties sometimes just sitting there. And I, can, I, could, I could go back to when I was six years old and tell you stories of how that's always just been a part of something I've had to think about. It, and I just want to sit there. Jesus says this, though. Let not your heart be troubled. That bad moment might come. That hard thing will happen. That unfair reality will appear. That thing that's going to hurt worse than anything and lead you to an unknown place is going to come. Let not your heart be troubled. I'm about to go to the cross and leave you. And Peter, you're about to deny me. Let not your heart be troubled. You see, you believe in God... I think in that moment, he intended for their intention to say, because you have studied the scripture and you know what they say. You believe in God because you've been taught about God from childhood. You believe in God because you've been to synagogue school. You believe in God because you have opened the scriptures and you have heard them read and you yourself have read them. You believe in God. Now believe in me. I'm that Messiah. I'm that reality at the end of Abraham's covenant. I'm that, that, that person who's supposed to come to be the Savior of the world. I'm who you're looking for. I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You know what you've read. You know what you've studied. You know these things to be true. Now, believe in me. And then I kind of picture him kind of leaning back a little bit and saying, you know, can I paraphrase a little bit? You know, up at Dad's place (laughs) in my father's house, there's a whole lot of places to live. There's a bunch of them. Uh, There's some rooms and some cottages and some mansions on a hilltop and some whatever else the songs have called them through the years. In my father's house, there's a whole lot of places to live. And I'm going so that you'll have one. I go to prepare a place for you. I'm not going to go away from you just to leave you. I'm not going to go away from you because I want you to be angry, sorrowful, or hurt. I'm going because there needs to be a place prepared for you. 
And a lot of times we focus on that and we think, oh good, Jesus went to heaven and he's, he's making the bed and stocking the cupboards and dusting off the shelves and getting me a nice soft comfy chair right by the fire so the right music's going to play and, and he's fixing me up a place. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. That pretty good reading of that, isn't it? But if he just goes and prepares a place and we miss how to get there, kind of a whole bunch of useless endeavor, maybe. Because we gotta, we got to get there. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, we got to get you there. And so, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. That means I'm going to come again. I'm going to get you. I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive you to where I am, so that where I am, there you might be also. So we have his peace, and we have his place, and we have the promise that he's going to come, and that he's going to bring us with him to the place where he's going. But by the way, where is he going that prepares the place for us? Is he going to, and, and here's where you've got to think about Scripture just a little bit. He said, I am going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions I go to prepare a place. Where is he going? If you read the timeline of Scripture and you see what happens in, in the passing of the, the reality of, of what's going on in the Scripture, what's fixing to happen is Jesus is about to go and hang on a cross. Where is he going to prepare this place. It's going to the cross. The preparation necessary for you and I to be able to attend that wonderful dwelling place that God has in His home for us was to the cross. Now later on, He's going to ascend into heaven. He's going to be sitting by the right hand of the Father and He's going to be calling out for you and calling out for me so that we have an advocate there. We have somebody on our side when we get there, but first, he's going to the cross. A place of torture. A very bad place. A very painful place. A place of death. He's not going to stay there. Then he's going to go to the tomb. A residence for those who have been tortured and died. He's going to be laid out in that tomb, left there, in the place of dead people. Where is he going to prepare a place for us? Well, first he went to the cross. The next place he went was to the tomb. And he said, I'll come again and receive you to myself. What did he do? He rose from that tomb. Three days later, the women came to the tomb and they tried to find him and he wasn't there. And they were worried about things like how to move the stone, just like with Lazarus earlier when, when Jesus uh, gave us that part of the story. And, 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 and as he got to, got to that tomb and he came out of that tomb, what did he do? He appeared. He appeared to the people that he said, I'll come again to, just three days later. Was that the appearance that he appeared to take them with him? No, because they stayed behind. And 40 days later, he ascended to go be with the Father in heaven. Where did he have to go to prepare the place? To the cross, to the tomb, back together with those people for some days, and up into heaven where today He is, waiting for the Father to say, go get them, go bring them to us, go bring them here. And so He said, listen, He said, you've got a promise that I'm going to come again and I'm going to receive you to where I am so that you can be where I am and you know where it is and you know the way. Now here's, here's the part of the verse that just, just, just makes me have to stop and think for a minute. You know where I'm going and you know how to get there. Perhaps, at least for Thomas's benefit, he should have said, and you ought to know by now with the time I've spent with you telling you everything I've been telling you, you should know by now with all of the scripture that you've read and all of the schooling you had as a kid and all of the talking that we've done and the time that we spent together as is our custom in the places of worship at the times of worship, you ought to know by now where I'm going and how to get there. But in the middle of all of that time that Jesus spent with all of those people, especially those 12 apostles of his, there's always somebody in there 
there's always going to be somebody in the crowd that's going to miss Jesus. They're going to miss what he said. They're going to miss who he is. And in this case, here's Thomas, the one whose heart was always troubled, the one who didn't believe anything he heard unless he could touch Jesus' hands and his side and see it with his own eyes. And here's Thomas. I know you just said that, but we really don't know. <laughs> what? Thomas said to Jesus, I don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus, I, I, here's what I see. You know, Jesus was a, a, a Jewish man, and so he uses, used some of the Jewish uh, idioms uh, there. In his time, and I can just see himself slapping himself in the head and going, Oi, hey, Thomas! <laughs> you know? How was that for a good accent in Hebrew? Those of you that speak Hebrew should pick up that Hebrew. Okay, I don't know. I see him looking at, at... How long have I been with you and you don't get this? How many times have I told you about this and you don't get this? How, much, uh, different, how many different places have we been to together? How many different examples have I shown you? How many people have we fed together? Thousands! How many people have we healed? Thousands. How many people have we preached this good news to? Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. We don't know that number. How many people have been raised from the dead? And there was a number for that. How many realities of Scripture have we fulfilled in the time that we've been together, Thomas? And somehow, in the midst of all of that, Thomas missed Jesus, and, and, and he just had to spout out. Verse 5, he said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know how to get there? He missed Jesus. Sitting right there in the room with Jesus, he missed Jesus. Please don't miss Jesus. Please don't miss Jesus. No matter what happens in the room, no matter what squirrel takes your attention, no matter what thing makes you angry, no matter how you got your feelings hurt, no matter how much money you think it's going to cost, no matter how much effort you are called upon to exert, no matter what he said or she said or how that preacher acted, no matter how neglected you may feel or how overwhelmed you may be, Wherever you go, whenever you go there, whatever you do, whatever you do there, don't miss Jesus. Thomas missed Jesus right there. We don't know how to get there. We don't know where. What have I been talking to you about for three years, Thomas? Why don't you know this by now? I'm amazed. When I talk to people in churches and I see them around and, 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 and we've been in a lot of churches over the years. I never have counted up how many churches we were in together. I didn't get Dad's resume out and I got a copy of it. I'm going to count them one of these days. And, and see how many churches we were in together and how many people are in so many churches that miss Jesus because they want to go on their feelings. They miss Jesus because they got hurt somewhere and they were looking at people instead of looking for Jesus. They miss Jesus because they're too intellectual to believe in somebody I can't see or touch or hear. And they miss Jesus even though he's in the same room with them telling them the truth. You know how to get there. You know the way. I have on more than one occasion had somebody come to me and tell me that they needed to be saved. It's somebody that I thought was saved already before. And we would be visiting, sometimes with tears, sometimes just matter of fact, sometimes with a question mark and all that. And I said, you do? Well, are you sure about that? Yeah, I know I really need to. And it didn't take much convincing for me that this person that I already thought was saved needed to get saved. And so you know what I tell them? You know what you're supposed to do. Get about doing it. And they say a prayer. It's not that a prayer is what saves you, but they confess their heart to God. God, I need you. 
I need to be forgiven of my sin and I'm tired of playing the game over and over and over again. I'm tired of just going to church every week. I need it to be real. I need it to fill me up. And Thomas needed it to fill him up because he had yet to really accept the reality of who this was who had called him out of darkness into light, who had fed him the bread of life, who had shown him resurrection and life, who had taught him how to bear fruit, who had opened the door and the gate for him to come through and had led him as a good shepherd to be the light of the world and Thomas is still going I don't know who, who, who where we're going I don't know how to get there Thomas I've been with you so long how come you don't know that but the scripture does not record that Jesus chastised Thomas instead of a word of rebuke he simply with matter of factness speaks to him the most pointed truth in all of Scripture. We could go to John 3.16. Same, same writer wrote it. For God so loved the world that He gave the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that's Jesus, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. What a beautiful verse and so true. God loved the whole world so much that He gave Jesus. And if we'll believe in Jesus, we'll have everlasting life. John wrote that in chapter 3, and now we're all the way over here in chapter 14. Almost three years have passed, and they've been together all this time. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? I wonder if Thomas was speaking for more than just himself when he said we, or if he just said the we to kind of take the heat off of himself. I don't know that either, but I do know this. Jesus wasn't going to let that hang. He wasn't going to let that stay there. He wasn't going to let that answer be unan- that question be unanswered any more than you and I should let that question be unanswered when somebody comes to us with a direct question about who Jesus is. Don't worry about hurting their feelings. Tell them the truth of who Jesus is. Too often we want, I don't want to hurt your feelings now, but Jesus, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him somebody may hear me say that that there is no other name under heaven and earth by which men must be saved than the name of jesus and they're going to say but i don't just believe in jesus i believe in this other god or i don't believe in the same jesus you believe in my jesus is different than your jesus and i'm telling you this if it's a jesus different than the one that god loved the world so much that he gave so that we could believe in him and have everlasting life it's a path to hell but if you believe in him it's a path to heaven no one comes to the father except through jesus don't miss jesus i'm glad jesus said it so clearly to thomas i am the way get out your gps and say how do i get to heaven and it's going I, I, I wish Google Maps would do this, you know. Hey, Google, how do I get to heaven? I wish it would just come up and flash. Jesus, Jesus. It won't do that. It'll say heaven, Illinois or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish it was that plain. I wish it was that clear. Jesus was that clear. You and I need to be that clear. First in our understanding and then in our explanation that Jesus is the only, the only. Uh, The Jesus of the Bible, the John 3.16 Jesus, is the only. The seven I am's in the book of John, Jesus, is the only. The I saw the Lord Jesus of Isaiah chapter 6. The only way, the only truth, the only life. And and it says, wait a minute, that verse doesn't say only up there, but it does down there. No one, nobody, nobody has ever got to heaven without Jesus and nobody ever will. Don't miss Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. You see, he said, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say if you confess with your mouth some God that sounds nice and fun and fine that you approve of and that you accept. It's Jesus. And all of these I am's that we looked at at camp these last few days, kids, point us to Jesus don't miss Jesus don't miss Jesus they point us not to church but being part of a church is what Jesus wants us to do but that's not Jesus don't miss Jesus just coming to church 
They point us to the Bible, and reading our Bible is something that Jesus wants us to do. But don't just sit and read the book. Know the author of the book. Don't miss Jesus. They point us to prayer, and we ought to pray, and we ought to pray every day and, and throughout the day. Not just Listen, prayer ought not just be something to do. You know, you wake up in the morning, and you read a verse of Bible, and you say a quick prayer, and that's all you do. I mean, through the day, stop and pray, and not just at food time. You got a minute, and you're thinking about God? Talk to God about it. You got a minute and you're questioning something? Talk to God about it. You're angry about something? He said, let not your heart be troubled. Talk to Him about it. You hurt about something? Don't, don't go, listen, don't go call all your friends when you get hurt. Unless you intend to call every one of them and everybody that they're going to call and tell them when you're not hurt anymore and you got over it and you figured out the reality of it. Talk to God about it. Go to Him. Spend some time. We ought to pray about it. But don't just sit there saying prayers. When we say prayers, there's books written with prayers. We can read prayers. Some of them are all right. Don't just say prayers. Because if you're just saying prayers, you're missing Jesus. But when you're praying and you're talking with Him, don't miss Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. Getting baptized, don't miss Jesus. A lot of people can get dunked, but they've missed Jesus. In a lot of other faith groups, they dunk babies and they sprinkle babies and pour water on babies and stuff and those babies don't know Jesus in the way that they need to know Jesus for that baptism to mean anything. Baptism is meaningless if you've missed Jesus. Don't miss Jesus. Which Jesus are you talking about? The one who said no one comes to the Father except through me. You miss Jesus. You miss heaven. You miss heaven. You ain't going to be happy. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But if you come to Jesus, eternity waits for you. Remember that piece of string I pulled out of my big case? And and what it, what it was, just a big old piece of string, and I had it in a, a big piece of luggage up here on stage, and, and, I, and I pulled my piece of string up, and I pulled it up. Uh, on the front of that big piece of string, that as I walked out and walked around, there was still some of it in there, because it was a big old piece of string. But about six inches or so of that piece of string I had marked. And the six inches of that piece of string represented who we are and what we are while we're on this earth. And the rest of that piece of string represents all of eternity. It represents the moment we die, the moment we stand before God and hear Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. It represents what will happen after that for all of eternity, and it's a long, 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 long time. We are so foolish at times that we spend so much time worrying about this little bit here. How I can be comfortable. How I can be happy. How I can keep from being angry. How I can all that stuff. That we miss the part about all the way into eternity. And we're foolish if we do that because we miss Jesus. Oh, He came to give us life and that more abundant. But more than that, He came so that believing in Him, we may have eternal life. You see, the whole point is this, and this was the point of Jesus, and it's my whole point today. No matter what happens in the place where you find yourself in any moment of any day, no matter what you're eating or wearing, no matter where you're working or playing, no matter what kind of car you drive or what kind of clothes you wear, no, no matter what other people think of you, which is a very small thing indeed, no matter how you feel about it, don't miss Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? No one is looking around, each one is looking within. And there are people all over this world today who know all about Jesus. They can quote you these seven I am things and tell you what chapter and verse each one of them in and they'll take you to John chapter 14 and John chapter 10 and John chapter 8 and John chapter 9 and they'll take you to all the different chapters about all of these different I am's and they'll tell you all about it and they know all about it but they've never really met Jesus. And they missed Him. Thomas stayed with Jesus for three years. I don't know how to get there. I don't even know where you're going. He wasn't listening too good. And you've heard so often and so many times about Jesus. 
please, please, don't miss Jesus. Father, in, in this room, and in the hearing of my voice, there are people who have missed Jesus. And more than anything else right now, I pray for them. I know there are hurting people and sick people and sad people and angry people and all kinds of people all around. But right now, Father, my heart and my mind are on those who've missed Jesus. I pray that they'll know how much you love them as you sent Jesus to us. As you yourself put on flesh and became a man so that you can show us how much you love us. Oh, Father, don't let us miss Jesus. Don't let the people who have continually heard about you miss Jesus. And don't let those who don't know much about you miss Him. Cause us to be good tellers about that as well. Speak to us now. Should there be some hearing me right now that don't know Jesus, I pray, Father, in this room, in this place, you touch them and draw them close. I pray for your will to be done now in every heart present. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing? Hey, have you missed Jesus? Wow, I'm so happy that you're with us today here at Second Baptist Church, celebrating what God's done and, and getting to look back at kids' camp and all the great stuff that's happened this week. And, and it's just been a pleasure and, and a great thing. And I hope that God spoke to you. I hope that he spoke to your heart, that if, if you don't know who he is, if you're not close to him, uh, that today he spoke to you and said, I want to be close to you. And we at Second Baptist want to help you with that. There's a ton of contact information on this forum. Love for you to choose your favorite one. Give us a shout. Let us help you with next steps, with first steps. Let us help you understand a little bit better of how God wants to be a part of your life and how he'll help you walk every single day. Check back with us next time we're on. Tell a friend about Second Baptist. And if you live in the area, come and see us right here at Second Baptist Church of Oatmonkey. God bless you. Thanks for joining us today.